Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all of my lectures and put them on YouTube and all my workflows and I put them on GitHub so that my students can access evergreen course content and working professionals can follow along and learn new skills in data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. Shout out to everybody. Hope everybody's well and healthy out there right now. So, if you followed along in my lectures, you'll know that there was a previous lecture, 9D Data Analytics, a reboot on spatial declustering. And in that, we showed some figures, we showed some examples, but we didn't give any hands-on experiential learning opportunities. So what did I do? I took and coded up declustering in Excel. Now, this is not the uh, sheet. It's pretty good, but it's not the Excel sheet that got me the Excel shirt. Shout out to Microsoft. Thank you very much. That was super cool when you did that. That was the Veragram one. We'll cover that one later. What is my philosophy? I code in Fortran. I code in C++, Python, and so forth. But I still think when it comes to teaching fundamental concepts, it's not a bad idea to code something up, code something up in Excel and then allow people to great accessibility to learn new concepts. Okay, so if you want to learn about declustering, hang on here. We'll do this in Excel right now. I have a previous video I just recorded where I did it in Python with my package Geostats Pi that has a Python version of declustering from GSLive. Okay, so now if you want to follow along, all you have to do is go to my GitHub account and under my account, there's Excel numerical demos. Now, this is cool. I actually am kind of proud of this, that there's a whole bunch of Excel spreadsheets that do a whole variety of different things in spatial data analytics, statistics, geostatistics, not so much machine learning here. Very hard to do machine learning in Excel, but a lot of things are here. Okay, and so we have a declustering, debiasing demo. Download that and you can follow along. If you want to download it, just select clone, download, download the zip. You'll get everything. Boom, you got everything. Copy out that or extract out that Excel demo with the debiasing declustering and away you go. Okay, so if you do that and you open up the sheet, you should have something that looks like this. Now, you have one rule when you work with my Excel spreadsheets. You only get to touch the yellow cells. The, now, if you look at this sheet right here, I know I always say I'm very democratic. I'm, I'm very much in the freedom, but I gave you no freedom here. You get one cell to play with, okay? What's the reason or rationale for that? If you change any other cell, you're probably gonna break something. It's probably not gonna work any longer. And I have no idea what you're doing now. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and walk through this. Now, you just opened up the sheet and there's a good chance that this value here is set to a different value. I can't remember what I uploaded. So please type 100 here and now we're together. Okay, so let's first take a look at our data set. We've got values for, uh, this could be porosity in space between zero and 100 meters. We have something very densely sampled here. Or maybe it's some mineral concentration, but I say porosity, so we'll just say it's porosity. So this is not a big area, but we have this densely sampled spatial data. Do you see one, two, three, four? You see all this data, and you see how it's kind of equally spaced around here? That's very interesting. Then what we have is we have all these values right here very close to each other. That is spatial sampling clustering. Okay, and that's exactly what we want to address with declustering. We want to try to mitigate for that. Okay, now let's just pay attention to the values now. You see 8.6%, 14, 8.6, 12.8, 18, 16, 16. You see all of these values, that area that we have the clustering are all pretty high values. It, in fact, if I was to draw a map, I would say it's high here and getting lower towards the peripheries or the edges of my area of interest. Okay, so now what can we do? If we were to go ahead and use a cell size of 100, this is one cell now, 
And if we look at the data values, here's the data X, Y. We have the actual porosity values. This is, if you click on the data here, this is exactly what we're plotting, X, Y. You see the, the highlighting there and the porosity values. Now, I did some fancy things with calculating a IX, IY index and so forth. This is my attempt to solve the declustering problem of discretizing and calculate discretizing into a cell mesh and calculating declustered weights in Excel. And I've done that without Visual Basic. So I had to use a bunch of columns and figure some stuff out. So don't worry about the white columns. We don't have to go through that right now. Now, if you look at that overall data set and you take the weights one and you multiply them by the data values and you divide by the sum of the weights, that's your declustered average. But since all the weights are equal to one, guess what? Your declustered average down here is exactly equal to the naive mean of the data set, which would be the, the average if we just calculate directly from the data, assuming weights of one. So it's the same thing. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's try something extreme. Let's change the cell size to maybe something like two. Okay. Now you look at it and that's pretty cool. Hey, I did that in Excel. Okay. Super cool. Is every datum has its own cell. They're all by themselves in their own cells. And if you go back to the lecture notes and we look at how we calculate the weights, we're basically taking one divided by the number of data inside of the cell. And so basically everybody gets a weight of one. They all have the same weight. Okay. And if you look right here, the mean that we calculate from declustering shown here too is equal to the naive mean. No surprise. We still have our error. Our, we have 7% error of overestimation right now in the naive and it's the same in the declustered because they're the same right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's pick another cell size. Let's see if we can change it up a bit. Let's try something like 20. Now, if you look now, what's happened? If you look through the data set, many of the sample data that were sparsely sampled or in areas that are sparsely sampled still have their own cells. But in the areas where we have this more dense sampling or infill sampling, we're starting to share cells here, here, and here. These are getting demoted now. What's the net result of this? Well, if you look at the declustering weights, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, all of these guys are getting 1.2. They're being deemed that they need greater weight. They're in sparsely sampled areas. And all of this data, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.3. So these ones are going to be the 0 0.6, 0 0.6, and these ones are all going to be 0 0.3, 0 0.3 weight. Okay, very cool. What's the net result on that? The declustered mean is now 12.4%. Now the true mean is 12.3%. That's awesome. We're like so close just by doing a little bit of declustering. We've decreased the error from 7.7% overestimation in the average to the declustered mean error of 0.4%. That's much more tolerable. We're, we're doing a much better job making an estimate. So if we were to try to estimate average porosity over this entire area of interest, we now have a value that's much more representative and less impacted by the clustering of the samples and the high values. So we could calculate oil in place over this entire area of interest, and we wouldn't have that nasty 7% inflation in oil in place or whatever we're trying to calculate. It could be contaminant, concentration, mineral grade, whatever it be. We're, we're interested in knowing the average for the purpose of knowing how to deal with and make decisions given that. Okay. So the other thing we can do is we can, we can go beyond just calculating the average. In fact, what's really cool is we can take the data, sort it. We can use the weighted cumulative probability, which is really just standardizing those weights because the original cumulative probability is assuming a weight of one for all the data. So you can see these are all equally spaced, three, six. There's a little bit of round off, but it's really equally spaced cumulative probabilities using a methodology like the I over N. Uh, this is not using I over N because it has the unknown tails on both sides, right? So in that case, it's going to be I over um, I over N plus one. Okay. So 
we go ahead and we can calculate the regular CDF just by sorting the data and using that convention with the tails. And we've done that in the previous lectures. But we can replace those equal values, the I's, with in fact the weights. And what happens now is you, if you look carefully, you'll see that these are not equal spaced anymore. Some data have greater weights and some have lesser weight. So if you go through here, you'll see some of the data actually have, as we look at the yellow line, very short jumps and some of the data have bigger jumps. They have greater weight. Isn't that cool? So the net result is that this yellow CDF is the declustered CDF using data sorted and using the weights for the cumulative probabilities. And now this distribution shifts in this direction. That means that we'd expect the average to be lower. Ah, so very, very cool. Now, one thing I want to point out here is look at the circles are in the same locations. We don't change the data values. We just change the weights so we can only move up and down. Just like the histogram, um, bars can move up and down, but they can't move side to side. We don't change the data values. We just give individual data more or less weight. Okay, there's a lot we can do. We could play around with this and try to get something that's better or worse. We could look at how changing the cell sizes um, are affecting the result. You can see here that when we go to 25 meters as a cell size, something interesting happens here. We start to overcorrect a little bit. Now, I want you to note something. Part of our issue with our solution and instability right now is because I'm only using one cell mesh location. I'm not doing the random offsets like we did in Python. Why? That'd be kind of a lot of work to code up in Excel. I just want to demonstrate the basic idea. I have no doubt that if we were to use multiple offsets, we'd probably find the 25 meter cell size would behave very much like the 20 meter cell size. Not too much difference. It's just, it's an arbitrary issue with regard to what data fell on what size and what boundary for each cell. Okay, I welcome you to play around with this. Try out cell-based declustering in Excel to gain a little bit of experience with it. If you're feeling confident with that, go ahead and try out the Python version. If you want to get to the Python version, it's available on my GitHub account. I have it right here. If you go back to my main account, Geostats Guy, and you go to Python numerical demos, you can scroll down here and you'll find Geostats Pi declustering. You can download that. There's a video also that was just recorded that explains how to work through that example. It has a nice little walkthrough for it. And I feel by working with the more complete algorithm of declustering that's been coded up for you in Python and improved visualizations, you get much more experience. You can put fingers to keys, try out realistic declustering like we would do in the real world with a more complicated data set and everything. I encourage you to go ahead and try it out. All right, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record all of my lectures on data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. I put them on YouTube and all the workflows on GitHub to support my students with evergreen content so that they can continue to grow and learn even after the course is complete, when they go off into their futures and have wonderful careers as scientists or engineers or maybe even lawyers. I don't know, but they go off and just have these amazing careers. I hope that this technical content will help them. Everybody stay safe.